All right, everybody, welcome back to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. Today, we're going to talk about building trust-based authentication with a whole bunch of open source projects, Spire, Spiffy, NSM, OPA, and um, two OpenShift Commons members, Frederick Kautz from Doc.ai and Sa Bobby Samuel from Anthem AI, are going to um, walk us through some really interesting content here and maybe lay out what all of those wonderful open source projects are that they used to make this happen at Anthem and other places. So I'm going to let Frederick and Bobby introduce themselves, take it away, talk for probably 30, 40 minutes, depends on how much content they have, and then give us some time for a conversation at the end. So Frederick, take it away. All right. Frederick, do you mind if I, I'll, I'll start? Okay. Sure. Um, All right. Because, yeah, you first. All right. All right, thanks. Um, so good morning, um, everybody, and thanks for taking time to join with us this uh, today. I um, hope you had a, a lovely Memorial Day weekend. And uh, Frederick and I are going to tag team here. So what I'll do is I'll, let me set up the business context into sort of the why. Why Why did we start this? Why are we on this journey? And why is it important to um, all of us as well as um, to people that, you know, carry insurance and people that work in this space? Why, why is this important? So um, let me set that up and then Frederick will walk into some of the technologies that we're working on. So Frederick, if you could hop to that first slide, I will um, also set us up. So um, I don't know where your eyes go when you look at this slide, but um, I was I was here at Anthem and I only see just three words on here, 2015 data breach. Um, that's I, I lived through that here at Anthem and it was it was not a great time. And so. Um, Anthem, since that time, um, and some of you saw it in the news, I think it was over 25 million. You can, you can go search on a, on a, your, your favorite search, uh, search engine. It's 25 million or so members had their um, private uh, health in, uh, information taken and, um, you know, taken out. And uh, we're still facing the repercussions from that. And so as a result, Anthem's reaction was to beef up traditional security. Um, and to, to put those uh, traditional security in place at, at one point in time, um, I believe it was um, a little over seven hops to get through our firewall to get to an external uh, website. And so we, we took a traditional model and we bolstered that or galvanized it even more. And um, as we've looked at the, it's, it's not sustainable long term. And uh, we're taking a second look at this. So healthcare itself is um, just the cost of healthcare. Those of you, um, actually, many of you that are in the in the U.S., U.S. healthcare spend is about 18% of our gross domestic product. It's a huge amount. To give you an idea of how that um, this compares to other Western countries, um, uh, European healthcare costs are about 9%. So stark, stark differences in how much uh, the U.S. is spending on on healthcare. And so um, what we've done is we've we've bolstered up our healthcare. We've seen we've bolstered up our security. We've seen healthcare costs rising, and we know that the model today that we have is likely not sustainable for you know the the generations to come. And so as we look at this, we've been partnering with many open source um, um, open source partners. So everyone from Spiffy to, to Spiffy to Spire, if you saw the last uh, CNCF um, um, presentation, we were talking about it there. Um, we're also in our world, we're using OPA, um, NSM, um, and then Keycloak to, to bring together a zero trust environment uh, and ecosystem. The, the why is really driven around, we believe um, healthcare and the cost of healthcare shouldn't continue to rise. We believe that the, uh, the data should be, um, should, be, should be shared and should be in places where it doesn't take uh, you know, um, entire teams of hundreds and hundreds of people watching firewalls and watching security protocols to make sure that our our data is secure, that our transactions are um, have integrity to them. So what we've done is we've started to work with various groups um, and among this group. And what we'd like to do is we're we're working with cloud native um, engineers, developers. And I know you don't most people don't think of Anthem as um, a place where technology is happening. So uh, what better place to do it? So we've, we've collected, um, we've gathered. So Frederick and many other folks that are on Frederick's team as well as my team, we've all gathered with the, with the fundamental belief that we can shift the way that we do security 
which then fundamentally shifts the way uh, that we do and we conduct our business um, for the better of the people. So with that, this is, this is our approach. This is what we're doing to set up a new way of doing, uh, doing business. And we believe that it's not just for our industry, but for several industries that are already uh, working this, jet, this direction, that we're just partnering and moving along with them. We wanna be um, not just at the forefront, but we, we wanna be part of the change that's happening. So with that, Frederick, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and I'll be available for questions as we walk through this. Great. So let's go ahead and um, get started. Um, so let's get started with uh, with a recap on some of uh, some history. So in order to really understand zero trust, we have to look at where we're coming from. And most uh, security uh, postures historically focus primarily on what we call perimeter defense. You have something that's untrusted that um, that goes through some security thing off in the firewall into some trusted environment. And so very often uh, it would look something like this where maybe you have the internet, you have some DMZ with some, uh, where you have your application gateway and then another firewall again to your corporate network. And this also goes in the opposite direction. Maybe you wanna connect from your corporate network to your internet, you have these multiple hops that you end up going through. And direct connections from the internet and the corporate network and back are implicitly denied. You have to go through the uh, through the firewalls. There's a variation on this. This is a lower cost, uh, maybe simpler to manage version of that, where you have a bunch of single firewall and you have your DMZ, and you're you're a hop closer to the internet and corporate network. So a little bit easier to set up, a little bit less. Uh, uh, I'm not going to say it's less secure, but uh, if but you have less places where you can defend, uh, but also still perimeter defense. Uh, we also have this in Kubernetes. And so when you connect in with client, you have some ingress controller that then forwards you into your pods. So once you're in the, uh, in, into the pod network, then uh, there, there are ingress and egress contr uh, controllers you can put on, which help tie it down, but you're still very much in a, uh, in a perimeter defense model. Um, Multi-site, uh, another, another variation. We have a trusted, um, a trusted network and another trusted network, and we have nodes in one side and services on the other that the nodes want to connect to. So you can see this building on the previous set of defenses that we, that we have. And so, however, the details matter. And uh, the reason I'm getting into the details is because um, it, in order to produce a good security posture, uh, a good security paradigm, it's not just locking everything down because you can lock down things very, very uh, easily. The problem is that you have to be able to lock them down while still providing your service and a, have the capability to scale that across a large uh, number of systems. So you're focusing on a single computer. Yeah, you can do a lot of things to lock it down, high touch and, uh, and techniques and so on. But when you're starting to say, hey, we have an entire company do we need to lock down or maybe you're working with fortune 500s and uh, a lot of red hat customers can appreciate this where uh you have thousands uh and that ten, tens of thousands hundred thousand systems then these details the security system has to work in such a way that it integrates with such a system. and so in this scenario and going back to this example we have uh, two trusted networks. Uh, there's a public set of IPs, uh, some private set of IPs. And a very common thing is to say, hey, let's go ahead and allow outbound uh, from this network over to um, to these set of IP addresses or and allow from this IP address to these particular services. And so we have some form of, uh, of network address translation that's going on here. And so a few questions then start to pop up like, how do, what if I want to differentiate between node one and node two? You know, I'm turning them all into one address in here uh, when I do my network address translation. Or what if I want to connect to uh, to more than um, to multiple services in in here, which is a little bit of an easier use case, but it's still something that discoverability is still important. On the server side, you also have questions like how do you trust a client, and how do you expose your services out to others, and how do you differentiate between node one and node two if it matters, and there's also a whole other, other set of questions about how do you populate and rotate your certificates uh, over time in the ways that 
these nodes over here uh, are able to to connect in when you start to to bring in encryption. And uh, one potential answer to some of these questions is, well, let's go ahead and bring a VPN in. And so what we'll do is we'll say this this entire uh, trusted network in the one i two one six eight one zero will will trust and connect to this and vice versa. And what they will do is they will inject routes so that they're capable of communicating with each other. And when you start adding in a third one, uh, you, you end up with this mesh type thing. Uh, you can sometimes reduce down, that scope down to, to a, like a spoken hub model. But in, in, to, from a mental perspective, this is what people tend to think of. Um, a little, little bit of an aside. So the, we're gonna deal primarily with layer three VPNs and why layer three rather than layer two? Uh, it all comes down to scalability. Um, I'll publish these slides earlier. I don't want to go too much into this, um, but basically, layer two tunnels are difficult to scale. Uh, layer th layer three is built on IP addresses, which is designed to scale, and we use that to scale the internet. Um, but let's talk about scaling subnets. So when we look at scaling subnets. Uh, when you have two networks, you're looking at one possible connection, three networks, three. Four networks, you're looking at six connections or six subnets, you end up having to, to deconflict. And so over time, what, ends up, what you have to do is you have to make sure that these all these subnets that you're hooking up to each other in these private networks, either you've uh, de deconflicted them or you're, pr you're producing some form of net network address translation in a very careful way in order to make sure that they don't conflict with each other. So this becomes a very global problem very quickly. And so um, in terms of, uh, of handling the, the conflict, you end up with very careful planning, but maybe, maybe you've done a lot of planning and maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't expect the type of growth you were getting, or maybe you had, maybe you, you brought on a new partner or a new customer who your part, who has a larger network than you were expecting or has requirements that they conflict with you. Um, what happens when things begin to, to break? You, you end up uh, bringing in your your uh, firewall experts, uh, things like checkpoints uh, uh, or Cisco firewall or so on, and you end up building up a, an IT army in order to in order to start handling all of these edge perimeters and handling all of the network address uh, the network uh, access control list, and so maintaining that list becomes uh, very uh, very expensive very quickly. So back to the original question then, how does all of this stuff that I describe end up improving your security? Because you end up with a lot of complexity. Uh, you end up with fragile configurations and you also have entire sections around observability and debugging in terms of how do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, and also we're still dealing with the assumption that the attack vector is coming from the outside. And I would say out of the entire set of slides, that's the most important line right there. So in other words, we are defending our infrastructure with 11th century uh, technologies. What if the attack comes from in here? So back to perimeter defense. This is the, uh, this is the world that uh, many of us currently live in. And what we are pushing towards is a zero trust environment. And I'll leave it here for a brief moment. So what we're doing is we're saying the network is untrusted. It is no longer the the, the core trusted thing that you have. And uh, when you stop when you stop trusting the network, that means you have to shift the trust somewhere else. And so where we are shifting this trust is to the workloads themselves. We're saying we can secure the workloads, and we can then develop secure connections between the workloads. Now to be clear, just because I say that this network is untrusted does not mean that it is not private. It could still be private. You still have layers of defense that you're building around. But if someone were to breach your network, you have other things to to mitigate, and the the, the secure connection could still be a VPN. But you're not relying on the security of that VPN for the majority of your security. And so when it comes to, to untrusted uh, networks, please don't think that I'm, that I'm saying everything has to be public. Although if you want a really good litmus, litmus test as to how well you're doing, you can play this as a thought experiment. What if I take my network and make it fully routable on the internet? Like, will I be able to sleep at night? And if the answer is yes, then that means you're probably doing it uh, right with, uh, with zero trust.
maybe you're doing it right. So, um, and so the idea is that if your attacker gets in here, then they're not able to connect to other things simply by being a member of that network. So the question then becomes, how do we achieve this? So we'll start with establishing a trust domain. We will attest the workloads. We will establish policy um, between the workloads. And we will also show an example of establishing trust between organizations. So the trust domains, you know, we're going to use uh, examples from Spiffy and Spire. Uh, they're both CNCF projects. Um, and Spiffy is, the, is a specification on how to on how to get work identity to workloads and how to rotate uh, that identity, that the certificates that they're that they're assigned, and do so in a hierarchy hierarchical manner. So we start with the CA, um, which is based on the X509 infrastructure, and what we'll do is we attest the uh, the applications underneath of them. And of course, there may be multiple layers in here. You might attest a, a sub organization, which then attests a cluster, which then attests your application gateway, but the mental model, think of it like this. You, you have attested a workload from some common uh, from some common route. And then once we've established that, that identity and they've received X509 certificates on each one, we can then create policy. So this policy is, uh, this is a, a modified example from Open Policy Agent. Um, and so the important things in this scenario is, where is the, uh, is the, we, we we can consume the the X509 certificate from OPA itself, and they, they call them SVIDs. We can we can consume the SVID, the uh, the identity from it. And so once we have the identity in here, we can check is this ID equal to this. And so we say in the storage API, the OPA would be sitting somewhere here or or a proxy right outside of it. Is it receiving a request from this workload here? So if it receives something that does not have this identity in a certificate. Then it will uh, it will reject that. So once you have that policy set up, then what we can do is we can is we can have a second organization that follows the same set of patterns and they attest each other. And if we want if we want to trust two two workloads together, what we do is we trust the two organizations at the top. The two roots trust each other and say I I. Org one says I trust org two will attest properly and vice versa. And you also scope it down to their to their domains. And so this means that when the front end app API, when the front end app server tries to connect to the storage API, it knows exactly who it's connecting to and vice versa. It knows where the connection is coming from using mutual TLS, which is available in TLS 1.3. And there's libraries to make this easy as well. And you can also use Envoy to lift things that are not aware of these type of concepts. Um, and then from the policy perspective, what we're doing is we're saying allow connections to, and we're setting a destination. We'll, we'll match on the destination of where it's connecting to. And this side says allow connections from, and we specify the uh, source destination from where it's coming from. So this would allow those connections to persist and to run whatever set of, uh, of HTTP verbs that, uh, that you allowed it to do. And so, Let's drive this down a little bit deeper, though. So when you're connecting two organizations together, you cannot assume that the underlying network exists. And so you have, in this scenario, we have a character named Sarah who's trying to connect to a secure corporate intranet uh, using her application. So just because you have the policy set up and the networks and your uh, your identities are set up doesn't necessarily mean you have a path to actually connect. So you're so you talk to your ops people, and the ops people say, well, in order to connect, we really need a firewall, an intrusion detection system, and then this VPN. So so in that scenario, you have to think, well, how do I actually go about doing all of this all this stuff? And so what we're pushing towards is uh, in the network service mesh side. We're saying, well, let's separate out the data plane, which is the things that uh, that Sarah wants for her application, and let's put a northbound control plane over this uh, over these elements. And so you can think of this similar to uh, to an SDN in some ways. Uh, the primary difference with an NSM is that it's it's more like an SDN for SDNs. It it'll talk to your to Kubernetes and it'll talk to your checkpoint firewall or whatever you're using. Talk talk to your intrusion detection system and talk with your VPN endpoint and make sure that it uh, passes information in and out. But 
Uh, I won't, won't go too deep into that. I have a lot of other material that um, that I can point you all towards for the internals as to how that happens. Just the important part is think of it as a control plane and a, and a data plane. And when these connect with each other and communicate with each other, then that allows us to configure the things within the data plane. Um, so what we do is we actually give each of these an identity. So your firewall, intrusion detection system, VPN, they all get SPIFI X519 identities. And so this allows us to know that when the pod is, is negotiating with the firewall, it knows that it is talking to the firewall using a zero trust model and simultaneously to the chain. So this allows us to build, when, once we have this identity, it actually allows us to build policy. We can say this pod is only allowed to talk to this firewall. This firewall is only allowed to talk to the pod and the intrusion detection system and vice versa all the way up until whatever is terminating that uh, that connection for you. So it allows us to build paths through that that uh, that translate into your into your data plane using Spiffy and OPA as those uh, as those things. So in in essence, we want something that looks like this. We want Sarah's app. It gets wrapped into some VPN gateway, goes over some cloud, some internet to your VPN concentrator or to the other side in your API. Um, and so pushing those up. Uh, the same concept as we had in the application side. We have the same set of attestations on each side that occur, and we have the trust that is put on the top. Uh, OPA implements policies at, at each of the relevant locations. Um, and a side effect of this is that there's no more application-specific network access control list in this in the way that you traditionally do it. So this will because we're saying this this application is allowed through some path to to communicate with this API using Open Policy Agent and vice versa. So we've actually lifted that into something that is more declarative, something that's human readable, uh, that does not allow, that does not require you to put down, and this is this is the, the IP address of the API server. This is the this is the IP address of where the VPN gateway is coming from, because we're now relying on cryptographic identity to do that rather than, um, rather than IP. So one important uh, detail to unify this is that these identities are, can be cross-cutting. We can say this identity is the same one that is used by your app, which is used by your service mesh, which is used by uh, your pod infrastructure, Kubernetes, and eventually we'll get it down to the hardware TPM, so that we can say this hardware TPM has um, came. This hardware came from a location that you have authorized, that you've uh, that you have yourself deployed. So even if a rogue hardware comes in and managed to replicate your stack. Even if it managed to gain access into some of your identity infrastructure, the fact that it doesn't have the right hardware TPM means that it would not be able to, to fulfill the attestation when, when it asks for what its identity is. And um, so we also have identity in the infrastructure. And the other side has it's a set of identity as well. So we have this cross-cutting identity for, for each of these. And so when we put it all together, we have the status quo, which is the internet. You have uh, some client connecting in um, and connecting into your application database. Um, and I apologize. I, this is a slightly different. This is a slightly different use case uh, from what we were showing before, uh, as the previous one showed uh, it being in a private network. Uh, I wanted to show off one more one more use case. So as we put it together. We have a client goes into connects into your to your firewall or so on application to your database. And so the question that I would like to ask people in a scenario to ask yourself is, if you have an attacker here, how much access does this attacker have? Um, and there's been a number of, of uh, very high profile uh, break-ins where the attacker got in through uh, Jakarta struts or other similar systems that were unpatched or even worse zero days. Once they got in here, they were able to do scans on the network and connect to the database, or even connect to a database that it already had a connection to, and start just asking queries that um, that uh, are above and beyond what it should have been asking for. And um, when we start driving this towards um, uh, towards a zero trust model, the uh, one uh, one modification we can make is we could say. Well, we have a client that we don't really know on the outside, but we trust that if the user has logged in properly, they'll have a JWT ID that is uh, that is cryptographic. So when we pass it in through the firewall to the application server, uh, this application server already has a zero trust chain between your application server, your database server, and database. And so 
we're already saying that the source and destinations for each of these are, are have been established properly. And so that limits the, the ability for this attacker to connect to some random database that's on the outside, uh, that's, uh, that's in the outside of this chain. And then we can further scope it down and say, well, if we have a cryptographic token that comes from, from the client and let's pass that in from, we receive it on the application server or we've tested it at the, uh, in the inbound uh, uh, API server before it hits the, uh, the application server. And so what if we were to pass that on to the, to the database server or to your database proxy and say, well, in order to unlock this API right here, this database server, it not only has to come from app server, but must have a valid JWT ID that we can then check does this ID here in the HTTP request path actually match what is in the JWT ID, but do this not at the edge of your infrastructure coming in, but actually do it further down. And every time it passes through your infrastructure, it'll check, does this JWT match? Does this JWT match? And so this means that you have that you have two conditions that you have to pass. You have to pass where is it coming from, application server in this scenario, and who authorized this request? Well, the client did from a from a client who was who was authenticated. And an important aspect of that is that means your violations in policy. Uh, if you have a violation in policy, that usually means one of two things: either you have an active attack going on, or you have a programmer who made a mistake that is causing your violation a violation in the policy. Either scenario, you have to get somebody to look at it and to and to deal with the problem. Um, so, where does that JWT come from? Um, in in the uh, open source uh, uh, in the open source path, we bring it in using something like Keycloak. So, Keycloak uh, communicates with our identity provider, and that identity provider, you notice, it is not part of this infrastructure. It's actually something that is managed uh, separately in this example. It could be in here. It could be part of your your application infrastructure, but uh, it it may also be a good practice to actually separate that out so that even if these continue to get, if these happen to get compromised, uh, that your identity still uh, still has some defense in it uh, and, or some increased defense, I'll say, because you already have the zero trust uh, model that's in there. And so this, uh, so the user is logged in, they receive a JWT and um, they receive it from Keycloak. So Keycloak itself, uh, allows you to have single sign-on, LDAP, uh, horizontally scalable. Uh, it's you're able to log in with OIDC, OAuth2, SAML, social networks. Uh, it was originally created by Red Hat, and uh, I believe it's been donated to the CNCF. Perhaps somebody can can help me out there after we're done with the uh, the slides. Uh, but the important part in this scenario is that it has the relevant things in order to allow us to integrate with uh, with identity providers in the back end. Give us a uniform, uh, give us a uniform uh, interface for that. Uh, handle the login and receiving and receiving and transferring of the JWT, which then gets passed into your infrastructure. And so uh, this this allows us to lift that zero trust even up to uh, to trying to defend the uh, the uh, uh, up, up to the up to the client level, even though there's limitations on what you can do on the client at this point. Um, with those, uh, we have some uh, some locations that you can go look at for some of this. Network Service Mesh, Biffy, Open Policy Agent, Keycloak, uh, Envoy, and Kubernetes. Uh, a couple interesting areas where uh, some interesting work has been done in here is, of course, Network Service Mesh is continuing to build out this stuff at the layer two and layer three level. Uh, Spiffy is working on something called transitive identity. So transitive identity is imagine this client. It's, this is like a, a pseudo transitive identity that I described where you pass the JWT down in order to pass that through. Uh, but you can think of transitive identity as uh, you imagine the client itself having an X509 certificate that instead of receiving a JWT, it receives a, a certificate. And that certificate has been designed in a way that it can say, application server, I'm going to give you the authority to perform some action on my behalf to uh, to the underlying infrastructure. And so sort of like, uh, imagine you want to talk with a, uh, like you want to have a lawyer do something on your behalf or, a, or um, and so, you're, so you give them uh, permission through some legal agreement to do something on your behalf through some transitive uh, uh, authorization. So you can name a transitive identity as something um, and uh, with that, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. 
We, we certainly do. Um, and I'm going to, because Luca asked a whole bunch of questions, so I'm going to try and unmute him and let him just ask his questions directly here. Sure. There you go. Luca, hit it. You can you guys, can you guys right. hear me? Yep. Yes. Yeah, so um, thank you for the presentation, first of all. It was uh, really nice and uh, really interesting. Um, I myself uh, work as a solution architect in API management, and uh, I touch on some of these topics, so I find it particularly relevant. Um, so when you were explaining the zero trust scenario, um, I think you were mentioning the fact that VPN and IDS are still uh, relevant, but uh, do I understand this right that in in this case, you would basically just need to configure uh, them to connect entire networks without worrying about uh, subnets and ACLs. Is that a correct assumption? So that's a, that's a really good set of uh, observations and a good set of and a good set of questions. And so, in terms of uh, intrusion detection systems, um, I put that in there because some of the companies that I've worked with um, are they, their current policy is that they have an intrusion detection system that's in there. Uh, in fact, if in the most basic level of intrusion detection system, I, actually, I personally don't think it's going to buy you that much. Uh, some more advanced versions of these things could maybe uh, help help you out a bit. Where if you had something that was capable of uh, of analyzing uh, HTTP requests that come in and look for anomalies in the type of requests that are being made, or uh, like then you can, things that are that are more in band or that are working at the L7 layer, and then I think that we can gain some uh, a significant benefit in in the model that I showed with uh, with those type of um, with those type of things. But they the traditional L2 and L3 uh, model that's uh, that's on there. Uh, it's there. There may be some areas where where it's still useful, but it's but because you're you're limiting where your where it receives messages from at such a fundamental level uh, that uh, it it does reduce the total amount of, uh, of value that you would get out of an IDS, even though there's still value there. Okay. Um, and the other question I had was when you were showing the JWT um, validation. Um, I think. Uh, this is the, the the OPA is getting a little bit into the API management field, right? Because uh, typically the, that's uh, one of the tasks that uh, the API gateway can do. So I don't know if you guys had already also an API management solution and managed to use that as well, or or. Ah, let me. Let me go a little bit more into this particular path. And so, uh, open policy agent is just uh, all all it really is is you think of it like a, as its own server, and you can embed it into an application if you choose to do so. You send it a you send it a string of uh, of JSON. It responds back with a success or failure, and maybe an explanation why, depending on how you've configured it. And so, it's capable of consuming. Uh, within those strings you, or within those, those fields, you may pass in uh, things like the headers or you might pass in uh, some the, the SVIDs or JWT tokens and so on. So it's not actually sitting as a, as it's not sitting here in this area uh, controlling the axes in between or, or so on. This is actually something that we would want to rely on something like Envoy Proxy and Envoy Proxy has the capability right. to inspect and to perform that. Um, interestingly, a lot of service meshes can help there because they already have uh, connections and the capability to configure um, uh, Envoy. The, there are still some gaps, though, uh, because many of the service meshes uh, don't implement the Spiffy protocol, or if they do implement Spiffy protocol, they've implemented in a very opinionated way that uh, may not make it as easy to integrate with other systems. Um, and uh, so one of the things that I've been uh, looking at is working with some of the uh, organizations. Uh, for example, I've been working with uh, 
uh, I've been having some initial conversations with uh, some of the individuals over at uh, Kong as an example uh, in collaboration with uh, with Network Service Mesh because we have a core committer who is both uh, a part of Kong and part of Network Service Mesh. And we've been uh, discussing about since we use uh, Spiffy and Spire within uh, Network Service Mesh already, that it would be good to be able to get that identity from Spire uh, in both NSM, which we already have built out, uh, and uh, also be able to get that identity from uh, uh, push into Kong, so that that way you can reuse those identities at the, at that location rather than having two different uh, identity solutions that we have to work out how to make them uh, play nice with each other. And so, right. um, Istio also has uh, uh, Spiffy support through a product called Citadel. Uh, I have not looked at Citadel, so I don't know how well it integrates with. Uh, like, if I were to stick a, if I were to stick Spire on top, could I have Spire control Citadel, or can I do nested Citadels? Uh, can I get Citadel to to work standalone if I don't want to bring Istio and I want to start bringing in things like, uh, like these patterns that I showed off? You could you could easily run them in in OpenStack or or other environments uh, with given a little bit of uh, of development towards that direction. Uh, and so, um, and that's part of the reason I was looking at something like Spire for this was because Spire runs as a standalone. It does not really require Kubernetes, but it integrates very well with Kubernetes. Right. Right. Uh, just one last question. Um, you were showing at the beginning uh, when the, you were explaining the setup for Zero Trust, the trust between Org 1 and Org 2, if I remember right. Sure. Um, I know. Yeah, so, yeah, this slide. Uh, so, is this like a, a typical scenario, or in in practice, you would have actually uh, some more, maybe just a department or even a development group trust another development group to make it more uh, strict in terms of uh, validation, so that uh, nobody can actually like reuse uh, the certificate and actually access. Uh, somebody else backend, or would you limit that in the policy with uh, OPA? Okay, so there's a there's a couple things towards this. So the, what the way Spiffy works is these certificates are very short lived. So it, the default out of the box is that the uh, the northbound CAs uh, are rotated once a day. The southbound um, the workloads are rotated once uh, once an hour. Uh, they actually rotate every 30 minutes, but they're, they have lifetimes of an hour, and they're rotated 12 hours, but lifetimes of a day. So if someone were to well, compromise a system and extract the certificate out, they have a very short window to perform their, their attack. So that's the first mitigation. The second mitigation towards this is the way that uh, Spiffy, uh, uh, that's, that Spiffy actually does the attestations. So the the attestations go up the chain uh, until you get something that can perform the actual approval, and so you're able to scope what type of approval. So if I have, let's say that I had like a third system under Org One that was like a payments uh, payments API, and I try to to attest that through the front end app server path and say, well, when I'm establishing this connection, and they're not supposed to be in the same cluster. Then uh, they would it would not be allowed to to, act, to perform that attestation because it would not meet the uh, the requirements for that particular system. So we can scope this down so that this cluster, this suborgan cluster, is only able to receive uh, certificates that are relevant to its uh, to its needs and uh, prevent it from attesting other things. Uh, the reason that we want to trust them at the very top with the top level CAs. In this scenario, is that we also want it's it's a trade-off to it so to some degree where you want to minimize the uh, the total number of uh, of connections that like we don't want to say here like let's send the front end app server every time we rotate certificates here let's send that all over to the second organization and vice versa. Uh, and so by establishing that at the top, you reduce the total quantity of communications right. on there. You're not telling them, hey, I have an organization. Here's the structure of my organization. You're right. just telling them enough information so they know who they, they're allowed to connect from. And the other thing towards that is that it also gives us a single break the glass location because if org one and org two decide that they don't want to communicate with each other, we can literally 
uh, destroy the trust here, and that'll propagate through your system um, relatively quickly because when it asks for the next um, for the next bundle, then that'll um, that'll end up removing the the bundle on there. And if you compare that to status to the status quo of, of most organizations in this particular area, uh, trying to perform that style of rotation uh, without Spiffy uh, can often take weeks or months if you need to if you need to go and configure and redeploy a bunch of software. So it, it gives us that dynamicness that helps mitigate some of those uh, uh, some of those concerns that you were describing. All right. So the, the just one last question, given the explanation about Spiffy. Um, so the whole rotation is managed by Spiffy itself, because I know that certificate management is always a, a headache in general. Uh, so yeah, Spiffy is a is a specification. It's part of the CNCF. Uh, it's a CNCF project now, but it is a specification designed specifically for for doing the attestation of workloads and then rotating this over time. So it's uh, it's uh, it's it's a gRPC based API. Uh, it's very easy to to uh, to build against, um, but it's designed specifically for uh, for solving that uh, that rotation problem over over a large organization. Okay, thank you. Sure, my pleasure. So I, I have a just if you're done, Luca. I have a question. A lot of this um, zero trust model is really about communication between services and technical um, between your internal systems and, and services. But um, maybe for, for Bobby, um, how do you communicate this new model to your internal compliance audit IT people so that they trust you that you're implementing this correctly? I mean, that's got to be a big issue um, at a company like Anthem, um, especially after the breach. How did that conversation go down, and how do you do that with like multiple acronyms, throwing that all at the compliance officers and your IT audit people? How does that fall out at Anthem? That's a very insightful question. Um, <laughs> it has not been uh, it's not been as straightforward as it would seem, but the the way we've started it is. Um, and just just to be clear, today our chief information security officer, our CISO, is one of our key sponsors for making this change. So that was something Frederick and I took on day one as we were talking about this and socializing it. So it, you're right; it's a lot of acronym soup, and it's a lot of new. It's uh, very new models for um, traditional sorts of infrastructure. So what what we've started with. Um, is doing this outside of the traditional systems that are up and running and that are, are really running today. So we're going to start first with proving this out in systems that are maybe let's call them less core. If they go down, things are okay. If they get they get hacked or breached, it's okay. Um, as we prove it out, um, we'll see. And the 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 CISO is working with us, team working with us to watch how it works to do pen testing. Uh, in fact, we're making our source code public. We and they were, their eyes were like, kind of were in horror. Like, are you are you serious? Yes, no, no. We we want you to know where every hole, every weakness is. We we want you. We'll even make it public to the people you pay to come in and and uh, your white hackers just white hat hackers just come on in and and do this um, because we're we we want to prove this out and we might as well prove it out with in the, the most dramatic and open and transparent fashion because this is what this technology is about. So that's how we've started. Um, in, say, give us give us about six months and uh, Frederick and I will have our internal prototypes, not prototypes, actual like functioning apps up and running. We're past the prototyping stage. Um, and then Anthem is, uh, in general, has not been a fast follower, but as we're looking to move more of our core on-prem type applications into cloud, they will just come onto our stack. So we're even building our entire stack so that core applications, they can bring their old security, um, they can bring their old security um, paradigms with them, but they will be on this new stack. So they'll just be moving to the new stack. Um, and one of the issues, Diane, that people run into in the insurance uh, or in, in the old uh, traditional brick and mortar business that evolved into using technology um, is 
if there are no customers, you, it's hard to get people to change. Well, they're actually bringing their customers with them. So it's not a migration from an old app to a new app. They'd be just moving their entire customer base onto the new platform with the with the new uh, with the new apps that they, with the apps that they're moving from on-prem into uh, cloud native. Wow. So yeah. it's a it's a big strategy. It takes a lot of time and effort. Um, a lot of people to keep. Uh, let's just call it kissing hands and shaking. Uh, sorry, shaking hands and kissing baby. <laughs> A lot of that as soon as COVID's, COVID's, uh, COVID's out, but just keeping the connections warm, reminding them what we're doing um, and keeping this to the forefront of their, their mind. But they also have, they, we also have some um, headwind, not headwinds, we have some, some wins in our sale in that it just costs a lot to do it the way we're doing it today. And mm. it's not sustainable. Mm. So those are all helpful things that work in our favor. And so we've, we've been welcomed with uh, open arms. All right. Well, well, that's good news. And in six months, we're going to have you back um, to talk about where you are in production um, readiness and, and whatever lessons you've learned over the past six months. Um, and so I, I'm looking, Waleed, you kind of had one, I think you had one other question. Um, I'll see if, um, oh, Eric, Eric is, has just asked um, a question a little bit ago, does this rotation itself represent an attack surface? Um, let me just see if I'm not sure. It's a great question. Um, I would argue that anything that you can communicate with uh, represents part of your attack surface. Uh, that includes the rotations, which means you have to have the proper security audits done on it, make sure that uh, you're securing those endpoints properly. So uh, I, I would argue, yes, uh, that is part of your part of your attack surface, um, and the same way that your firewall itself can be a or your uh, virus scanner. There's uh, scenarios where virus scanners have had bugs in them that have allowed people to compromise systems. Uh, and so, uh, please, please treat. It, I, in fact, I insist you treat it as part of your attack surface, and that you you analyze it to make sure that it's being uh, secured properly and that. Problems with uh, within it uh, are also are also mitigated. Um, Spiffy and Spire were designed uh, with that in mind uh, in terms of reducing the total quantity of privileges to, towards the southbound. Similar to uh, Kubernetes does this with with pods, where it can expose portions of the API out, uh, but it will limit what uh, what things in the southbound can do based upon its uh, its capabilities. And so, uh, but yes, in, in short, that that does need to be uh, that does need to be considered. Okay. Well, we're almost out of time, um, and this is all new to me and new to a lot of the people who are on this call. So we're definitely going to have to do some more follow up conversations around this, um, so that we can all um, learn from your experiences and your expertise. So thank you very much, everybody, for for sharing this. Um, we really hope um, that you get um, something from this conversation. I'll be posting it on YouTube and I'll get the slides from um, uh, Frederick um, and post them as well on the openship.com blog. Um, and please reach out to both Frederick and Bobby. Um, the slide, if you throw up that very first slide, it ha oh, we didn't put your emails up there. Good on that. That's a, that's a trust surface that we didn't want to touch on or something, no spam. But um, we'll, we'll figure out how to get you guys connected. Um, so as well as if you come into the Slack um, for OpenShift Commons, if you're not there yet, let me know and I'll, I'll add you in. Um, and we will continue this conversation um, online. So thanks again, Frederick, for reaching out and Bobby for taking the time today. Um, and as always, for being participants in the Commons. We truly appreciate that. So thank you all very much and take care. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.